Thanks, All right. So this talk is about faster non-convex stochastic optimization than SGD with a subtitle, How to Swing by Settle Points. So first of all, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to give the talk and the organizing the workshop. I really learned a lot, including something towards the end of the talk will actually reflect what I learned the day before yesterday. So let's see. Good. So uh, this talk uh, is about solving the following problem, that is to minimize an unconstrained non-convex function fx. So without loss of generality, I'm going to write fx as an average over functions f1, f2, until fn. Okay? It's without loss of generality because n can definitely be one, but actually in many, many applications, n is really huge, especially in like training a neural network. Actually, regardless of how complex the neural network looks like, the problem of training a neural network uh, is nothing but minimizing a function like this. Well, n here corresponds to the number of input training, uh, input, uh, training data. For instance, if we're doing some uh, convolutional neural network, if we have like a million images to train, then each fi could just correspond to the loss value with respect to the ith input training image, and therefore like n could be you know, a million in this example. So some people also write it as an expectation over functions fi, which allows the index i to really be drawn from an infinite set. So throughout this talk, I would also be able to support that, but just for notational simplicity, I'm going to write them as like an average over you know, functions f1 until fn, but feel free to think about n being infinite in this talk. So that's the problem I want to solve. So in this non-convex world, so what is our goal, right? So perhaps the simplest goal is to find approximate local minimum, sorry, approximate the stationary point, meaning a point that has vanishing gradient. This is goal number one. But we also know that uh, a stationary point may be either a local minima or a settle point, and uh, especially motivated from a lot of practical examples in deep learning, we know that the uh, settle points are really not so great, so we want to also avoid that. So local that, maximum. sorry? Maybe local maximum. Oh yeah, in principle local maximum, but that's not very likely to happen. So let me just define settle point to be you know, both settle points and a local maximum, okay? Therefore, like a second more ambitious goal is to uh, find approximate local minima, which are pictures like this. So this will be the main focus of today's talk. Uh, although, like, let me still spend one more slide uh, to mention about even more ambitious goals, like such as approximately finding, say, gl a global minima. So we know that this problem is simply hard, but there really exists a lot of heuristics that reduce this task number three to task number two, such as graduated optimization. Suppose we want to minimize function f3 sitting here, and uh, if we use an arbitrary local minima algorithm to find local minima, then we may get stuck either here or here or here or here. So that may not be so great. And the whole theory of graduated optimization says that uh, what we can do is to smoothen the objective by a random perturbation. So say that we define new function f prime to be the same as before, except that we add a random perturbation a theta vector, which is drawn from, which is drawn from like a bore of radius r. So if the radius is large, then we get function one. If the radius is small, we get function two, uh, and so on and so forth. So the theory of graduate the optimization says the following: that is, instead of directly minimizing function three, we can first use a local minima algorithm to optimize function number one. So we get this point. Then we, move, we reduce the radius and we go to function number two and then we find a local minima and uh, we continue in this fashion. So this heuristic really works very well in practice and it could help us to successfully avoid some very poor local minimas, uh, including you know, the ones that uh, sit on top, like these ones. So once you smoothen the objective, uh, you know, bad local minimas will go away. But still, we have the issue about, uh, you know, maybe the algorithm will fall into either this local minima or that one. So that comes the other heuristic, that is to do random seeding. So if you generate enough random seeds, then in practice, you can also get a reasonably better local minima. Uh, without further overdo, let me just state that even if you're interested in this more ambitious goal of number three, still this talk can be relevant. All right? So the talk is about achieving goal number two. So let us see like what are the prior works. So pretty much like the only like online result sitting here is stochastic gradient descent, which also happens to be what everyone now uses in training neural networks. So stochastic gradient descent, uh, 
I claim that he finds an epsilon approximate local minima, which I'm going to define later, in this number of rounds, one over epsilon to the fourth power. Okay? So throughout this talk, by saying one round, I mean one back propagation. That is, if you have a neural network of, say, this size, then once you have an input image or input data, then you do a back propagation just on that input only. Okay, so that's one back propagation. So one round means one back propagation. So this result uh, was essentially first shown by uh, Ronge et al. Uh, although they, in their current version of the archive, they only proved the result that's polydimensional over epsilon to the fourth power, but I was told that the original authors are on the way to get rid of the poly D factor, uh, and we also know how to prove that, but I will, we will wait for the original authors to publish an updated version. So throughout this talk, I'm going to refer to SGD uh, to have this complexity, uh, order one over epsilon to the fourth power. So in this talk, uh, I am going to introduce an algorithm that uh, we call Natasha 2 uh, that can find the same kind of local minima in a smaller number of rounds without additional assumption. Yeah. What are the assumptions in the first one? Um, so you mean in go number one? Oh, in this one. Yeah, so I will come back to that. Uh, maybe not immediately, but in a few slides. So to give you a full prediction, okay, there are three necessary assumptions in order to achieve any minimal, minimal, uh, meaningful conclusion about local minima. One is the variance of the gradient has to be bounded. Two, the function has to be smooth. Otherwise, like you may not say like you have an uh, like a function like this, then if the gradient changes too much, then you know finding a point with small gradient necessarily means that you have to exactly find this point. And therefore, like even achieving goal one requires uh, smoothness, and also one needs second order smoothness to uh, claim anything useful about local minima, but I will come back to that slide later, okay? So I will mention about the, uh, about the assumptions. So at this point, let me make a quick remark. Those two results uh, have their complexities to be really independent of n. So this is what we refer to as online results. So this is in contrast to some other algorithms like full gradient descent and so on and so forth, in which the complexities have some polynomial dependency on n, for instance, like n to the 2 thirds, n to the 3 quarters. Uh, but this talk is pretty much only about the online methods, but towards the end of the talk, I will also give you a survey about what are the known results, ours and others, uh, regarding the offline setting, okay? The reason we want to really focus on the online setting is because uh, you know, n could be really huge. Not only like n could come from the uh, number of input, uh, say, training data, uh, it could also come from, say, graduated optimization. So if we do a perturbation of the function, then in principle there suddenly becomes like infinite number of functions that we're averaging about, uh, at least in principle, and therefore like designing online algorithm is really very important. So this is the method I'm going to introduce. Is there any advantage to doing mini batch at all, given that this you get something independent of uh, n? So throughout this talk, uh, I am not doing any mini batch version of anything, but in principle, even if you have an algorithm that has like say an N dependency, if you do a mini batch, I don't think that gives you an N independent result, even if like your mini batch size is like uh, square root N or something that's huge. Uh, not, uh, not that we are aware of, I think, at this point. So in the convex case, uh, that becomes a little more and more possible nowadays. Yeah. Good. So before I go into any technical details, let me just first like mention a very intuitive uh, kind of approach using pictures. Remember our goal here is to find the local minima. So this goal naturally re uh, reduces to actually the following two tasks. That is, let us first try to find an approximate stationary point, which is really goal number one. But now suppose we have found a uh, stationary point, then there are two possibilities. Case one, it's a local minima, in such a case we're down, right? Case number two, if we really are currently inside like a stable point, then we need to necessarily escape from the settle point. So what do I mean by escaping from settle point? It's really like go in this direction, uh, which corresponds to the negative Hessian, uh, negative eigenvector of the Hessian of the, of the current point, and we wish to really escape from that. So this was the idea that, uh, that is pretty much used in uh, the prior works, and let me elaborate that a little more, again using pictures. What is this business of escaping from set of points? 
So suppose that I draw the gradient flow of a function around a settle point. Uh, then necessarily there exists uh, at least one direction in which the gradient drives us out of the settle point and one direction that drives us, say, towards the settle point, okay? Uh, I'm only drawing two dimensions, but in principle, the dimension can be high. So now, uh, a critical observation here is that as long as you start from a point that is not really on this central line, for instance here, even if it's very close, as long as you follow the path of the gradient of the function, you can escape from settle point. Okay, this is always true, but what comes difficult here is what is this rate of escaping from settle point? So you can imagine that the closer you start from, uh, from a point near the central vertical line, then the slower the algorithm escapes from settle point. And this really comes uh, now this idea of random perturbation that says, uh, because of this effect, like my point can be close to the vertical line, then what if I do random perturbation? Suppose I say perturb the point uh, inside a unit bore of, uh, in the d-dimensional space, then we know by you know, concentration theorems with very high chance we're not going to uh, land in anything inside this belt, and therefore like after perturbation our points could be either on the left or on the right. In such a case, we have a bounded, a lower bound about how close the point is to the central vertical line, and we can prove a rate of escaping from set of points. So this was uh, this idea of escaping from set of points in which previously researchers have really proved the bounds about that and showed that the stochastic gradient descent plus uh, random perturbation can escape from set of points in this number of rounds. Uh, and uh, this year they showed that gradient descent can escape from this number of rounds. So the first one is an online complexity, the second one is an offline complexity, okay? So this is the business of uh, escaping from set of point. So in today's talk, I want to uh, promote a new notion that is to swing by a set of point, okay? So I borrowed this uh, terminology really from high school physics or maybe middle school or primary school for some of you. Uh, so remember that we learned if we send a spaceship to the universe and suppose we want to make a turn, right? then the most energy efficient way is not to directly make the turn, but to swing by a planet like this. So therefore, can we actually also swing by a set of point? So here's what I mean. Suppose we are currently at a point like here, okay? Then maybe we are moving like upwards. Then somehow if we can magically have a telescope that tells us, yet yeah, in, like in our path, in our trajectory, very soon we are going to hit a stationary uh, hit a settle point. So if we can somehow have such a like uh, uh, crazy telescope, then immediately like we have a warning that is if we don't do anything, we're going to crash into the settle point and then we have to escape from it and it can be uh, energy inefficient. A very natural thing at this point to do is to give the spaceship a kick and once you are here, then this time like you can just swing by the settle point if you follow say the gradient flow. So of course, like a lot of technical details are missing here, especially what is this telescope and what is this path? And things can become like even uh, more crazy uh, if we only have stochastic gradients rather than the exact gradient of the function. So these are the uh, technical details that I will fill in in the rest of the talk, okay? So at this point, uh, I'm ready to talk about assumptions before I go into the details. That is, I'm going to make three necessary assumptions. The first assumption is I'm going to assume the variance of the stochastic gradients uh, is bounded. Okay, that is, if you take a random i, then the expectation of this vector uh, minus the true gradient, this is bounded. So I claim this is a necessary assumption because uh, think about it, if this is the full gradient of the function, but if your variance is really infinite so that every iteration, if you make a query, like you can make a very large kind of error, then you necessarily have to put your step length to converge to zero or to really be something close to zero and therefore you don't get a very good convergence rate. And therefore like uh, we're really happy to make, uh, to make assumption on the variance uh, of, the, of the stochastic gradient and this was also assumed by all different variants of stochastic gradient descent. So we're happy to assume this. So this is uniformly over the COVID. 
Yeah, so in this talk, to make things like the notations uh, simple, I'm assuming like uniform sampling from the FIs. Uh, but the, it can actually be drawn from a distribution in such a way like you have to redefine oh, no, this in. The bound is uniform over the whole, it doesn't depend on Oh the yeah, say it's uniform like over all the points. Uh, if it's not, uh, I guess you can, uh, if you happen to know like how the variance behaves in different places, you can maybe change your learning rate at different places uh, to be uh, to be adaptive to such values. But for this talk, say that we have a uniform bound. Okay. If about the previous questions, if you have this bounded variance and you want to do mini batch, uh, is the batch size depend on n or on like one or epsilon something like that? Uh, so in principle, you can do the mini batch size for any size you want. Uh, so yeah, yeah. if you have a larger size, if you have a larger size, then the uh, the, value, the variance really can be reduced uh, by a good factor. But uh, a few other things may not necessarily be reduced. So I'm happy to talk offline to tell you like how things progress. So in the in short, like, uh, uh, so in, in this, throughout this talk, I'm assuming the mini batch size to be one, just for the simplicity of presenting everything. Uh, of course, like, one can re so for nearly all variants of like first order optimization algorithms, including the ones today, uh, we can um, we can uh, include the mini batch, and the same proof will go through. Then the question is like, does the number of iterations really reduce by this factor of the mini batch or not? Uh, I'm happy to talk offline more about this. So that's the first assumption. The second assumption is Lipschitz smoothness. That is, the gradient of the function doesn't change too much. If I move from x to y, then the gradient changes by a factor that's at most the parameter l times x minus y. Again, like it's a uniform constant l for simplicity. Uh, this, again, I claim is necessary because if you ever want to, uh, because if the function is not Lipschitz smooth, it could be like this, then if you ever want to find an approximate stationary point with even epsilon being, say, 0.5, that necessarily means that you have to find this point exactly. But that could uh, be impossible, uh, yeah, just because, like, uh, you know, as an adversary, I can hide this point to a place that uh, the algorithm doesn't ever even make chorus to the function and so on. Yeah. Uh, so I need a double-sided version from both. So this one implies that the Hessian is bounded both from above and below. Yes. Yeah, but your example just requires a both sides. Oh, uh, that's true. So I'm just drawing a very simple example as a hard instance. So therefore, like, uh, in other words, to make any conclusive statement about vanishing gradient, one really needs the smoothness about the function. So this is also assumed by SGD in the non-convex setting. Okay. In the convex setting, it's not needed. But in the non-convex setting, the convergence rate of SGD really also assumes Lipschitz smoothness. So for a similar reason, I'm also going to assume second order smoothness in this torque, meaning that the Hessian also doesn't change too fast. So this is for the similar reason as before, that is in order to make any conclusive statement about second order information, meaning like a local minima, so that talks about the Hessian, then I have to assume that the Hessian doesn't jump you know, from a point to a point nearby. So those are really necessary assumptions and also required by uh, prior works on SGD uh, in the non-convex setting, okay? So for simplicity in this talk, I'm assuming all the three parameters are one, just to make the notation simple. Uh, in the full paper, you can see you know, how the parameters also show up. Okay, is this good for the assumptions? All right, let me now begin with task number one, that is, what is really this telescope? Okay, so by definition, what is a settle point? A settle point is a point in which, <laughs> if you compute its Hessian, it has a negative, strictly negative, eigenvalue. So in other words, if we have a delta strict settle point, that means at least one of the eigenvalues is below some threshold negative delta. Now, by the second order smoothness of the function, we know that if we move to any point whose distance to x is at most, say, delta over two, then at that point, there's also a negative eigenvalue that is uh, below minus delta over two. In other words, at any point, say y, suppose we can find a unit norm vector v such that v transpose the Hessian times v is less than or equal to minus delta over two. This gives us in some sense a certificate of being really close to a settle point. 
In fact, mathematically, we can do something very simple. Uh, that is, once you have obtained, later I'm going to say how to obtain such a vector, but once you have obtained such a vector, then uh, we can continue to do a kick. The kick means that we either go in the direction of V or we go in the direction of negative V with the step length delta and say with, uh, in principle, you can choose to either go the positive or negative direction, whichever that decreases the objective better. Uh, but in theory, you can just choose the sign to be random, either go left or go right. So one of the two, then you can show that in expectation, the objective decreases by an amount, which is at least a constant times delta to the third power. So this is a consequence of the second order smoothness that only requires two lines to prove. Okay, so this is therefore the kick. But still, I haven't solved the question about how to find such a vector v. Okay, let me now really abstract away this problem, okay, using just language of matrices, but not hasn't. So suppose we have a matrix M that can be written as a stochastic form, so it's an average of M i's, then this yellow box is an independent problem about finding the most positive eigenvalue of M. So if we can solve this yellow box, then we can simply set the M to be the negative Hessian and MI to be the negative Hessian of FI, and then we can solve the original problem. And therefore, on the next few slides, I am going to talk about this problem that may be of independent interest. That is, we have a stochastic matrix and we wish to find the most positive eigenvalue of that matrix. Okay, we want to find it as fast as possible. But what do I mean by fast? By fast, I really mean two things. First, I want the complexity to be online, meaning that I want it to be independent of n, the number of pieces. Two, more importantly, I wish to support only computations that are matrix vector products, meaning that whenever I compute mi times, say, an arbitrary vector w, then I increase my complexity t by one. Okay, so t counts the number of matrix vector products with respect to those like mi's, but not with respect to m, but with respect to mi's. In other words, I wish to construct an algorithm that has the smallest value t as a function of the approximation error. Okay. The reason I want to you know, restrict myself to this model but not allowing things like uh, you know, explicitly storing the matrix or matrix inversion uh, is really because of the following reason. Uh, in, that we can view like in two different uh, angles. On one hand, from the field of approximation algorithms, we all know that computing matrix vector product is cheap, that takes only a and z time, which is the number of non-zeros of the representation of the matrix. So, you know, for instance, David Woodruff has been explaining like why this is important quite a number of times on, once, uh, on Tuesday. So, like, even if like, uh, from, from a different angle, back to the original question about uh, each mi being really the Hessian of some uh, function fi, I claim that this is also very important here uh, to restrict ourselves only to operations like this. So suppose that each function, you know, once we are minimizing a function, then the function has to be given to us, right? Suppose each function is described uh, in a description size s, meaning that it's described by a size s uh, arithmetic circuit. Then I claim that, uh, claim two things. First, computing as gradient requires only linear time in terms of the input description size of the function. This is really because of the chain rule of derivatives, which is known as backpropagation in machine learning. But something that's perhaps a little bit less well known is the fact that computing matrix vector pro uh, uh, has in vector product can also be done in linear time in terms of the input description size. So this was actually discovered more than 30 years ago, uh, published in neural computations. But now, for instance, using like the TensorFlow package, you only need two lines with one back propagation uh, or two, depending on the implementation, then you can support uh, computations like this in the same complexity as computing the gradient, okay? For this reason, I really wish to uh, study this restricted computational model that is to support only matrix vector products in terms of finding the most, say, the most positive eigenvalue of M. So this is a task of independent interest. So let's see how to solve it. Perhaps the most natural thing that comes to everyone's mind is power method. Recall that power method uh, without loss of generality assumes all the matrices to be PSD, if not you add a multiple of identity to make it a PSD, then the top eigenvector doesn't change, 
you know. And here's how power, met uh, power method works. Uh, we initialize with a random vector, then we keep multiplying the matrix M to the left of V0, say, T times. In the very end, if we normalize uh, the vector, then we have a guarantee that uh, V transpose MV, uh, MV is at least uh, one minus epsilon multiplicative approximation uh, to the largest Lagrange value of the matrix, as long as T is larger than or equal to one over epsilon. So this is a very simple to prove folklore result about power method. But in our case, we cannot really allow computations of you know, m times a vector. We can only support like mi times a vector. Therefore, like, can we have a stochastic version of the power method? Perhaps the most natural thing to do is to replace each m with mi. So we know in expectation, m equals to the expectation of mi, right? But this idea doesn't work because even though this final vector vt in expectation is good, but its variance is really huge, like it dominates like the expectation of the value and therefore like you do not get any meaningful information out of this process. So somehow the correct stochastic version of power method is the following. Originally discovered by Oya, also like from the community of biology and neuroscience. That is instead of multiplying mi, which is too aggressive in each iteration, we multiply it by identity plus a positive learning rate eta times mi. Okay, well eta, you can think about it as something that's uh, pretty small, something one over root t, the number of iterations, that kind of quantity. So this is Oya's algorithm. As you can see, like this matrix in expectation is identity plus eta times m. So still, like if you view this as an instance of power method, then the final vector should align to some extent to the largest eigenvector of identity plus eta times m, which is the same eigenvector as m, the largest eigenvector of m, right? And therefore, intuitively, this algorithm should converge. So this is called Oya's algorithm. Uh, unfortunately, the convergence rate of Oya's algorithm was not really well understood uh, until this year. So with co-author Andrew Lee, we finally showed that if you apply Oya's algorithm with a fixed learning rate, if you choose the learning rate to be one over root t, then in the very end, if you normalize the vector vt, you get an additive delta approximation in just one over delta square runs. And this turns out to be optimal information theoretically. Okay, so let me make a few remarks. Uh, first of all, uh, the proof is really not intimidating. It's only one page proof, but it comes as a, it's kind of a one page tricky proof uh, that comes as a byproduct of our follow the compressed leader framework, which deals with the, the same case, but even the matrices can be, the MIs can be chosen like adversarially. So it's a more difficult setting, but as a byproduct in the very last section of that paper, we have a one page proof for this, uh, this result. Uh, so that is nice. And this, re uh, this proof uh, was also motivated by a very beautiful work of Jane, uh, of Jane, Jean, Kakedi, Naturopali, and Sitford, uh, in which they show that OES algorithm has uh, a convergence rate uh, that doesn't look like this, but assuming the matrix has an Eigen gap between the first and the second Eigen values. But this result we showed here has no Eigen gap assumption. So that's the, that's the point here. Uh, and the finally, like even if you want to find, say, not the top one eigenvector, but the top, say, 10 or you know, 20 eigenvectors, there exists a block version of Oya's algorithm that also allows you to do it uh, that becomes much, much, much more involved to prove. So it's a 60 page proof uh, that's going to appear like in 10 days in this year's Fox. If you're interested, I can, I would talk about it in that talk. So, uh, this is really the remarks I want to make here about this algorithm. Yes, in principle, I will assume that maybe you have MI, the variance of MIs are also bounded, and it was from the bounded variance from like gradient. So the, that, that's a good question. So in order to get this result, uh, in some sense, we need the variance of MI to be bounded. But that's really a byproduct of the fact that uh, each MI has a bounded, uh, uh, bounded, say, spectral norm, but that's actually a consequence of the Lipschitz movements of the functions, okay? So it does not come from the variance of the gradients, but it comes from the smoothness. It's like the zero order, first order, second order assumptions. This comes from the first order assumption, all right? So that is a result to put it back to this picture about the telescope. Now we know exactly what this telescope is. That is an algorithmic procedure, which is OES algorithm, that says, let's do one over delta squared rounds 
or in other words, one of the delta squad back propagations, we can either find a uninorm vector v such that v transpose the Hessian times v is less or equal to minus, say, delta over two. In such a case, we do a kick, uh, and we can decrease the objective by delta cube. Or if we do not find such a vector, it necessarily means that the Hessian uh, at the current point has all the eigenvalues larger than or equal to, say, minus delta. You see, like, there is a delta gap between the two things, and that's the additive approximation error on the previous page, right? So now, like, if we, if we run into the second case, that is, we conclude all the eigenvalues are large, we wish to essentially do this. And now comes task number two, that is, what is this path? Okay? Let me rewrite this problem. That is, we are currently at a point x0 that has all the eigenvalues of the Hessian being larger than or equal to this threshold, minus delta. And then we wish to find a point that is an approximate local minima. Yeah. I was wondering about the vector v in that previous slide. Do you choose one fixed v and keep using it, or are you using a different random v in each round? So, uh, so let, let me, since I have reloaded the definition of rounds, let, let me say it differently. So at any point, for instance, if I'm here, uh, I y compute a new v corresponding to the Hessian of the current point. After I have moved, either do a kick or maybe have moved later, then actually in a number of iterations later, I'm going to invoke this process again at a different point, and therefore it will be a different v. Okay. Good question. So this problem is now like uh, I have a starting point with all the Hessians, eigenvalues of the Hessian being large, then I wish to find an approximate local minima, uh, which means that it has a vanishing gradient and all the eigenvalues of the uh, Hessian are larger than or equal to some threshold minus delta. So this is what we say an epsilon delta approximate local minima. So towards this, uh, the end of the talk, I'm going to pick delta as well. But at this point, let's think about the problem as a double approximation. So we have two parameters. One is epsilon and one is delta. So let's abstract it away at this point. So this is the goal. And I claim that this problem actually reduces to a seemingly much simpler problem, which is to achieve the same goal. But this time, instead of assuming that only at the starting point, I have all the eigenvalues of the Hessian being large, but I have the eigenvalues of the Hessians being large for all the points in the space, okay? So I claim that the first task actually reduces to the second task uh, that is, at least from definition, easier. So this reduction was explicitly given by Carmen, Ducci, Hinder, and Sitford, uh, and implicitly given by us in like two papers that appeared on the same day on archive. Uh, and here is how this reduction works. First of all, a simple observation, I can get rid of uh, this part because I already have the assumption that all points have the Hessian uh, eigenvalues of the Hessian being large, and therefore I can get rid of this point, okay? Now I want to show this problem reduces to this. So there are two things I need to show. First, I need to construct a new function f from this function little f, okay? And then I need, uh, I, I need, need to show that function satisfies this property. That's the first step to prove a reduction. The second step is to close the loop and show that any algorithm that finds me a point satisfying this, I can turn it into a solution to the original problem. So this is a reduction, right? If I can successfully show this, this is a reduction. Let me first say the first thing, that is how to define this new function big F. So I'm using this language of our common et al. So they defined the function big F to be the same as little f everywhere like inside a unit Ball, uh, inside a ball with radius delta. So this red regularization term, you can see that it's zero whenever the point is close enough to x zero, <laughs> and how close it's by distance delta. So whenever you have a point that's inside this ball, then I do not make any changes to the function, okay? But if I am outside this ball, then I add a quadratic penalizing term, which turns out to be uh, the distance minus delta, this whole quantity squared. So this is the definition of big F that has appeared in the result of Carmen et al. So now uh, let me prove to you that this function satisfies this property for all the points in the space. There are only two cases. If the point is inside the bore, then we know that big F is the same as little f, 
and I claim that for every point inside the Bohr, then the eigenvalues of the Hessian are above, say, negative three delta. Uh, throughout the torque, I'm ignoring constants. So if I prove three delta, it's the same thing here, okay? So the reason is as follows. At the very original point x0, I have this minimal eigenvalue of the, uh, of the Hessian is above uh, minus delta. Now by the smoothness, namely the second order smoothness of the function, if I move by a distance of delta, then yes, the Hessian can change, but it cannot change too much, and therefore it can be maybe at most the two delta or say three delta to be safe. And therefore the minimal eigenvalue if you move from x0 to anything inside the bore remains to be lower bounded by something that's a minus a constant times delta. Then for any point outside the bore, I claim that the Hessian of this new function has all the eigenvalues being non-negative. This is because uh, big F is the summation of little f and the red term here. So the little f function, because it is first order smooth, that means all the eigenvalues are lower bounded by say minus one. Remember I assume the smoothness to be one for simplicity. And then the red term has uh, all the, the red term is exactly quadratic if it's outside the bore, and therefore like the red term has Hessian being at least one for all the eigenvalues, and therefore if you sum them up by additivity, you get zero, okay? So that proves this new function, big F, satisfies that all the eigenvalues of all the points are above threshold minus, say, three delta. Now, let, I, in order to show this is the reduction, I need to close the loop and show that uh, as long as I have an algorithm that for this big F problem can help me find a point with vanishing gradient, then I can turn this point into a solution to the original problem, okay? Here is why. Suppose I have found a point satisfying this. Then there are, again, two possibilities. Case one, uh, if this point is inside the board, then I claim we're done because every point in the board has its eigenvalues of the Hessian being large, and therefore we have solved the original problem. Okay, so that's case one. Case two, if the point is outside the ball, then I claim that we also win, but for a different reason. We do not directly solve this, but we win by some other measure of performance, which is, uh, think about it. If we have an algorithm that moves from x0 to, uh, to this point x, then as long as the algorithm is like uh, reasonably defined, then it has to decrease the objective. That necessarily means that this, the objective big F on this new point X should be less than or equal to the objective of the point I started with. Whatever this is true, I claim that we win because big F is the same as the small f at the, the starting point, but there is a red penalizing term sitting here on the left hand side. That means if this point say X is say two delta away from X zero, then the red penalizing term will be say delta square. That means if you look at its term, fx is less than or equal to fx0 minus delta square, that means we have decreased the objective by delta square. And therefore, like, we also win. So this is a very informal description about how this reduction works. In other words, like, we either find a point that is already a local minima, or if we fail, then we have to decrease the objective by some significant amount. So therefore, like this problem, now what it remains to, uh, for me to do is, in this talk is really to you know, propose a solution to solve this problem. Let me now rewrite the problem. That is, we have a function, instead of using the big F, let me just use the small f. So uh, I have a function small f that's an average of fi's, but now I have the assumption that is, this function has the eigenvalue of the Hessian being large for all different points above some threshold uh, minus delta and I wish to find a point with vanishing gradient. So this again becomes a problem of independent interest and if you can solve it fast, you can solve the problem of local minima fast. So uh, a little bit into, uh, like notations. So we know that in machine learning, including the previous talk, uh, we have seen a lot of use of the word strong convexity. So we say that a function is strongly convex essentially if it's Hessian has all the eigenvalues above some positive threshold, sigma. So in the remainder of the talk, I want to introduce a n new notion called, uh, uh, called strong non-convexity. I say the function is delta strongly non-convex if all the eigenvalues of the Hessian at all the points are above some negative threshold, minus delta. So this is just analogous to the strong convexity above. 
Then, um, for instance, the blue curve here is 0.2 strongly non-convex, and the yellow term here is one strongly non-convex. That just makes my verbal explanation faster. I don't need to carry around the word, you know, eigenvalues of the Hessen all the time. So as you can imagine, the larger this parameter delta is, then the more convex, sorry, the more non-convex the function becomes, and therefore it should become harder for an algorithm to converge. So this is precisely the thing I want to study. That is, I wish to uh, study, like, can we have a complexity bound, for instance, for first order methods, so that uh, it can take advantage of this value of delta. For instance, it can it be a curve that you know, increases as a function of delta. So it turns out that for most of the prior work, this is not true. For instance, stochastic gradient descent, it sits here. Uh, that means stochastic gradient descent can find a point with a uh, gradient at most epsilon in one over epsilon to the fourth iterations. But somehow, um, in a few slides, I'm going to elaborate why that somehow stochastic gradient descent cannot take advantage of this parameter of delta, even if the function I'm feeding to SGD is delta strongly convex, and even if the function, uh, even if the algorithm knows the value of delta, still it cannot take advantage of delta, at least in theory. Okay? Uh, some other method, uh, this was a breakthrough the result by Lei, Ju, Chen, and Jordan. They called their algorithm SCSG, but it's essentially a variant of SVRG in which they show that you can get one over epsilon to the 10 over three sitting here, but again, this algorithm doesn't take advantage of delta. So what we proposed uh, in this paper as really a byproduct is a method that we call Natasha 1.5 that achieves this curve. So in the very right end, it matches the best known result uh, of SCSG, but on the left end, the complexity can reduce, uh, but there's a barrier of one over epsilon cube that we cannot overcome. So this is this result of Natasha 1.5, but why is such a curve helpful? So let me illustrate that using, again, this picture of swinging by set of points. So suppose we have a telescope that can help us detect all the set of points with parameter 10 delta. Then uh, I claim that, yes, we can still swing by set of points, but we can only swing by it uh, like uh, very slowly. But if we have a stronger telescope that can detect all the set of points with parameter minus delta, that means we can detect more set of points. And therefore, if you follow a path, whatever the path is, then you should intuitively expect the path to be faster. Because this time we know more information about the potential set of points around us, and therefore we should be able to make use of such information and go faster to swim by the set of point. And this is precisely uh, the point of a curve like this. That is, if this parameter is smaller, meaning that we can detect more set of points, then we should have a speed which is smaller. We should have a complexity t that is smaller. Okay? And if we have a larger parameter delta, then we should run slower. And therefore, like, whenever one can get a, converge, uh, a convergence curve like this, taking advantage of delta, then we can translate this into a useful algorithm for finding approximate local minimum. So in a 45 minute talk, I don't think I have time to exactly describe the algorithm, but still, let me use one slide to give you some pictures about why this is potentially possible. So I'm going to use the language of linear coupling that uh, Lorenzo Arrecchia and I have been proposing really for three years now. That is, we divide really first order methods and first order analysis into two categories. The first category is what we call gradient descent type of analysis, and the second category is what we call mirror descent type of analysis. So in a non for a non-convex function, gradient descent means the following. That is, at any point, say xk, we can draw a quadratic upper bound of the function that is tangent to the current gradient of the function at the current point. So this red quadratic function is uniquely defined so that it's tangent to the gradient hyperplane and also has a curvature one. So by the smoothness of the function, we know this red curve is an upper bound to the original function. And therefore, if we compute the minimizer of this function and call it xk plus one, then we can move there, and that guarantees us to decrease the objective by this quantity. Okay. So whenever an algorithm and its underlying analysis uses you know, some analysis like this, then we say it's a gradient descent type of analysis. 
So this is in contrast to a different class of first order methods that we summarize as mirror descent type of algorithms in which they, instead of upper bounding the function, they try to lower bound the function in the following sense. At every single point, you can compute the gradient, which is a hyperplane, right, in the d dimensional space. Now, if the function is convex, then we know this is a lower bounding hyperplane to the function at all points. The whole theory of mirror descent in the convex setting is saying that we can somehow make intelligent queries at different points so that hoping that in the end we have a number of linear lower bounding hyperplanes and then we make use of that to somehow get some convergence uh, for first order methods. So the mathematics is actually a bit harder to describe, but at this talk, I just want to use this picture to describe mirror descent in a very informal sense. And already we can observe something very interesting is going to happen for non-convex optimization. That is, in the non-convex case, we cannot use this lower bound because it's not a lower bound to the function. But instead, if you draw a quadratic lower bound, which is a function that's tangent to this, uh, to this uh, gradient hyperplane, but with curvature negative one, then by the smoothness of the function, we know this is a lower bound to the original non-convex function. So this is something we proposed uh, in last year. Uh, that is a non-convex generalization of mirror descent, and therefore if you make different queries, you get different lower bounds, and somehow if you intelligently make use of a combination of such lower bounds, you can also prove something about vanishing gradient. So this is something we discovered uh, last year. But what is now very interesting here is that suppose you have delta strong non-convexity, then the lower bounds get improved. If delta is say 0.1, then the uh, curvature, curvature here becomes negative 0.1. But unfortunately, the upper bounds, the quadratic upper bounds like this, it never gets improved because you know, that's about the upper smoothness of the function in contrast to the lower smoothness of the function. And therefore, an algorithm, if it uses gradient descent type of analysis, then it cannot make, take advantage of this value of delta. So this is why, for instance, stochastic gradient descent and the SCSG, they cannot really take advantage of delta. And this, is, this was the whole point of proposing a new algorithm uh, that we call Natasha 1.5 that achieves this curve. So uh, I don't have time to describe the algorithm, but this is how it behaves. So on the last slide, let me just uh, describe the pseudocode of Natasha 2, okay? Very simple, here's how it works. Starting from any point x, we first try to use OYAS algorithm to detect whether or not we have a unit vector so that the vector uh, V transpose that has n times V is less than or equal to say minus delta over two. If we found it, then we do a kick that is to go in the direction of either plus V or minus V and we can guarantee to decrease the objective by delta cube, okay? That's something I illustrated in the first half of the talk. But if no, that necessarily means that at the current point, the Hessian has all the eigenvalues being above the threshold. And in this case, we invoke Natasha 1.5, which helps us to find a point with vanishing gradient. Uh, then we also hope that this point is close to x, because if so, then we have uh, this x prime not only satisfying vanishing gradient, but also because being close to x, it also has all the eigenvalues being large. So therefore, again, there are two cases. If we succeed, if we successfully found a point that's x prime satisfying this and near x, then we're done because that point is an approximate local minima. But if not, remember like that guarantees us to in some sense also decrease the objective. And if you dig into the mass, this is how much you can decrease. So in the very end, you just, this is the entire description of the algorithm and therefore if you uh, tune the parameters between the two cases, this is the final th uh, theorem you can prove. That is, Natasha 2 finds an epsilon delta local minima in this number of rounds, or this number of back propagations. As a simple corollary, uh, if you choose delta to be epsilon to the one over four, then the number of back propagations is epsilon to the minus 3.25. So in optimization, we sometimes say that the point is epsilon approximate local minima, uh, as long as delta is less than or equal to epsilon to some constant power, and here in this result, epsilon is four, but don't worry too much because even in our prior work, 
this constant is at least four. So for instance, SGD finds this type of local minima with a constant C that's not very explicit in the paper, but believed to be at least four uh, in this number of rounds. And therefore, this, this corollary is a strict improvement uh, over stochastic gradient descent. So uh, I know I'm running out of time, so let, let me now like, put everything on the table. So what do we have on the, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the whole field of online non-convex stochastic optimization? We have algorithms that find stationary points and algorithms that find local minima. So SGD, if you use it only to find stationary points, this is the number of rounds. And SCSG has this number of rounds. SGD plus perturbation has like, for, uh, achieves local minima in this number of rounds. And Natasha 2 sits here. So Natasha 1.5 actually sits here with the parameter delta, and this is the curve that I draw earlier. So uh, actually, now comes also the point for open questions. So actually, in the convex case, one can use SGD to achieve uh, upper bound, which is epsilon to the negative 2.5. But to the best of my knowledge, the lower bound is epsilon to the negative 2. So even in the convex case, we don't know what is the best rate yet uh, for finding a point that has vanishing gradient. And not to say that in the non-convex world, uh, you know, what do we, what is really the optimal thing? So these results all assume like bounded variance smoothness. Uh, for the second order smoothness, you only need it if you want local minima. So that's a summary for the, on, uh, for the online case. And there's actually a similar picture you can find in the paper about the no, uh, offline setting, which are the algorithms that have complexity that depends on n. So these are the best known results so far. Uh, thank you so much. I hope you have enjoyed the process of swinging by a set of point. Time, you know, we'll probably delay. The, I mean, we're finishing anyway, so I think, you know, we'll know uh, I think we'll probably delay questions, you know, just even taking offline. Uh, I think also for some reason none of the organizers are here, you know, to close the workshop. So I guess we should. You're not one of them. <laughs> You're not no, one. Oh, <laughs> don't tell me. Oh, Alex <laughs> is there. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay, there's not much more to say <laughs> from the organizer. But yeah, thanks for all the speakers and thanks for, for attending the workshop.